of welcome to our three distinguished speakers. Uh, we have Professor Willy Cronier from WITS and Professor Dan van der Horst van, of uh, University of Edinburgh, who has visited our beautiful shores and experienced load shedding as well. And then finally, we have uh, Ms. Lauren Nell from Natural Justice. So I'm not going to ex give a sort of long explanation about the purpose of the seminar series. Uh, I did that for the last seminar. In a nutshell, uh, I thought that there was a bit of a gap in the national discourse around renewable energy, which to date has been focused very squarely on the national auction program to add renewable energy to the grid. So the renewable energy independent power producers program. And meanwhile, while people try to cope with load shedding and energy security, get energy security, there has been a boom, particularly in solar energy markets, but in different market segments. And that these, these different markets have differential policy and legal, there's different patterns and different legal landscapes. So um, today we are going to be focused on what we call the community, communi what I've called the community sector. Um, like last week, I just to, before I get stuck in, a vote of thanks to the founder of my chair, the Claude Leon Foundation, that enables me to do this cool work. And then secondly, to Magda Janse van Noordweg, uh, who has assisted me in um, in bringing this together. Magda, you are, a, you are a star, and her assistant, Reason Sabir. So thank you to Magda and, and Reason. So I'm just going to give a quick recap of what we heard last week which kind of will lead us into the discussion today. So we heard that in the household sector, the, the solar energy market is booming. 12 billion rand alone in, in solar imports just this year. We heard from Mark Duplessis of Standard Bank that the solar energy market is projected to grow by a trillion rand over the next four years. And that because of this kind of permanent state of load shedding, um, and then incentives like the solar tax incentive and the re recently announced energy bounce back guarantee scheme. This is, you know, this, this, this wave is going to continue. We heard that people are financing their solar energy systems through home loan re-advances and that there's been a massive uptake of solar energy as a service. But what became very clear uh, as we had the discussion was that this, this is kind of servicing the upper and middle income households. Um, Mark Duplessis even, Mark even noted that they're trying to find a solution for properties that are valued from 800,000 to 1.5 million. But what about all the properties that are less than that? And people were asking in the chat, what about the poor? So, uh, you know, is it is it a pipe dream to think that informal households and property that is valued at much less will also be able to enjoy the benefits of solar panels and inverters and batteries. Um, is it possible that we'll see a broader dissemination of this technology to, you know, but my dream, I have a dream of an Africa lit by, by renewable energy. And then how will this be financed? What, what role will the public sector play? Uh, will the market take the lead? Will we see solutions like microgridding between uh, corporates and communities? So the, these are the and, and then shifting not only from talking about generation, but then also to think about the grids themselves. And then what kind of governance arrangements are going to be necessary to ensure that those grids are maintained? So I just wanted to share got a few quick slides. Uh, just to kind of um, also acknowledge the research that has already happened in the space. So this is a this is a map. This has come from a map developed by the Gauteng City Region Observatory, and it really is looking at access to alternative water and electricity sources in Gauteng alone. And the research found that the, the basic message is that household access to alternative electricity and water has been increasing over time. So if you look at the energy, we go from 0.8% in 2013 and 2014 to 5% in 2020 and 2021. But at the time that the research, only one in 20 households had access to alternative water or electricity. Those figures might, of course, already be changing quite dramatically with the kind of surge in demand we're seeing this year. And then this is uh, interesting here, that 
Over time, wealthier households have accessed alternative electricity substantially more than poor households. So uh, you can see there from the first bar is 2015, 2016. Um, this is ma ma monthly household income. Um, and then the, the increase in access to alternative energy sources. So you do see that the you know, wealthier households have accessed this more. But what is interesting is that you kind of see it across the board. I thought that was an interesting outcome of this research. Secondly, we are starting to see this is a picture of uh, a the announcement of a microgrid up in the Northern Cape uh, for a place called Swatkop Dam, which until now had never had electricity because the transmission grid didn't get there. And this is an ESCOM project basically powering uh, about 40 houses that had never had electricity before. And it's a generation a gener generation facility with a microgrid. And um, what I found particularly moving about this report was that people were just so happy to be able to boil a kettle and not have to boil the kettle on a wood stove. So we are st starting to see some of these projects taking off. Um, you know, in this big endless country of ours where there is huge spaces between places, um, is this going to be a solution that is not only, you know, for 40 houses in a really isolated Cape in the Northern Cape, uh, or a city in the Northern Cape, but for, for other places in our country where, where it might be more economical to have these microgrids. And then this is just also looking at some of the research done by the Institute for Economic Justice uh, at WITS. Um, and just looking at the inequality, but focused on the, I just also wanted to highlight this, um, this research on the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Program, but not so much focused on, you know, microgrids and then the technologies that, that can take solar to, to less wealthy neighbourhoods. So with that brief introduction, I'm, I'm going to introduce my, our speakers now because last week, I introduced the first first speaker and then we got so carried away that I forgot to introduce the second and third one. So I'm going to do it all in one go. And then I'm going to ask our speakers to speak each for about 18 minutes. And I will turn my camera on uh, when you are sort of approaching your 18 minutes so that you know you're kind of there. So my fir our first speaker is Professor Willy Cronier, and he is a professor in the School of Electrical and Information Engineering at WITS. And his research has been focused on self-standing renewable energy systems, particularly in contexts where there is little or no infrastructure. And uh, Professor Cronier, I just have to say, I don't know if you remember this, you've probably worked at WITS just a little bit less than I have. But in my one of my first environmental law lectures, I, I invited you to come speak to my students. I don't even know if you even remember. And even then you were saying people need to take charge of their own energy security. And you had this anecdote about when you boil the kettle and people tend to fill the kettle and they boil the whole kettle and that it's actually completely wasted energy. And I've never forgotten that. I always I often think about that when I boil the kettle and we actually have a flask next to our kettle so that we keep the boiled water there and not waste the energy. So I just want to say to you that that had a huge impact on me um, and I'm so pleased that you can talk here today. Our second speaker is Professor Dan van der Horst. Um, he's a professor of energy, environment and society at the University of Edinburgh, and he studies societal transitions toward environmental sustainability, um, trying to understand why progress has been so geographically and even mostly slow and often unfair. And he's written extensively on the emergence of new energy landscape, paying attention to how citizens engage with cleaner energy technologies. Um, and Dan, you and I have had sort of sporadic engagement over the last uh, 18 months, and I'm so excited to hear what you have to say today and um, also hoping to be able to see you in Edinburgh uh, later this year and to see some of your context there. So thank you for joining us today. It's really great to have you here. And then our last speaker is Lauren Nell. Lauren is an attorney working for Natural Justice, and she's the coordinator for the Just Energy Transition Africa Initiative. And she works across, Lauren has uh, many, many, she's a multitasker. She works across different hubs with, uh, uh, across natural justice to advocate for the acceleration of clean energy in pursuit of a just transition across Africa for the benefits of indigenous people and local communities. Um, and she previously worked for Legal Resources Center and Amnesty International. So Lauren, thank you for joining us today. And so without further ado, 
I am now going to hand over to Professor Crenier. Thank you, Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, OK, I'll share my screen to get to the slides. OK, so um, this is the title that uh, you are using and community grids that comes close to the work that we've been uh, engaged with for the last few years. So I will try to give you an insight into why we've decided on certain approaches in, in this work that we're doing. So first of all, I would like to give a bit of an energy context of how and where electricity, and that's basically the most convenient form to have your energy in, because it can be uh, exploited in many different ways. Uh, we look at some facts and megatrends behind that, and then recent developments and, and the future, as, as we see it with our R&D. So, so, yeah, ESCOM, SR on the brick of uh, load shedding, uh, that's not uh, yeah, yeah, something new. Uh, economic growth will, will uh, lead to, to more uh, load shedding, uh, all kinds of interesting logic applied. This one at the bottom here is very interesting. Huh? This is a report that came out in, in uh, the UK after uh, a, a grid event. Uh, they had some, uh, if I remember correctly, it was uh, wind turbines uh, disconnecting, and then the whole grid frequency went down and there was a huge uh, a scandal about it. So it's not just in South Africa, it happens at various uh, layers, uh, if I can put it that way. And uh, let's look at that. So um, looking at facts, the electricity uses and generation is one thing that we need to consider. The cost, obviously, uh, the human development index is especially when you get to the lower socioeconomic uh, layers, the strata. Um, then uh, I'll try to focus more towards Africa and South Africa, because this is where we are. Uh, why are we looking at photovoltaic as an energy source? I'll, I'll dabble a bit with the population distribution, because that plays a huge role in understanding uh, the problem uh, across Africa. So this is from the BP World Energy Review. Uh, it's already a bit dated, but it shows some interesting trends. Um, the red is the east. Asia, uh, China, those countries, uh, huge growth, increase in use of electricity. Uh, yellow is uh, Europe. Uh, the orange one is the Middle East. And uh, then the light green is Central America, South America. And then the dark green is uh, North America. And then right at the bottom, the blue is, is, uh, is Africa. And Africa, obviously, is still by far the smallest uh, or lowest electrified uh, continent, but it has a steady growth. If you look from 1985 up to 2015, there is steady growth. For interest sake, I've included this uh, global financial crisis and the impact it has had on the use and the generation of electricity is a real slump there in 2009. Um, but that didn't really impact Africa because Africa is already so low, it just sort of passed through that. If you look at the continent and where the electricity is mostly generated and used, South Africa is by and large still the, the single largest uh, consumer, uh, mostly because of our minerals processing industry, very heavy use of, of a huge amount of uh, electricity. Uh, then Egypt and then the countries on the Mediterranean coast. And then the rest of Africa, if you look at this graph, it drops off precipitously and some you don't even notice because it includes even these small islands where there's probably just one petrol generator or something on that island. So in South Africa we should still count ourselves lucky that we have the most even if it's intermittent. Uh, affordability, South Africa appears twice here. Uh, 
we were at one time quite famous for having very low electricity cost, but then it has moved up. We're no longer down there at the bottom. And, and that has, of course, impacts on the ways we do business and how we, how we live. Uh, this is an extract from a slide I prepared uh, in about 2013. Uh, based on the IRP 2010, which only appeared in 2012. And the blue was the projected uh, growth in our grid capacity. Um, the one at the bottom is what ESCOM said, if they have to retire their fleet of old uh, generators, how things will go. And me being not such a pessimist, neither such an optimist, I thought the green line might be where we we might be heading, uh, given the practical constraints on how you actually build new power stations and so on. The reality as we stand here today is that we are probably floating around in the green, but close to this orange. Uh, on some days, we only have less than 30 gigawatts available uh, from the ESCOM side. So we, we, we basically hugging this ESCOM line and that has all kinds of uh, implications for our future, if we look at that. Uh, human Development Index is something which I find really helpful in understanding and explaining. Uh, United States, we know, has a very high standard of living, and also they are world champions in using energy. In this case, it's not just electricity, so we use oil equivalent, yeah. Germany, it's also a very high standard of living lower consumption because we know they have the uh, energy vendor and they've been trying to bring in renewables and drive efficiency for many years so they yeah uh, basically the uk and denmark are even further to the left being even more efficient but it's interesting to look at africa where south africa obviously is is the one we we are closely related to in Libya. And we see our bubble size, which is basically the CO2 and, and emissions, is similar to Germany, even though we are a, a less industrialized country. We, we're still making a lot of fumes. Uh, and you uh, can also see we enjoy quite a high standard of living, maybe not the same as in Germany or, or the USA, but fairly high. The interesting thing for me, though, is that Botswana has overtaken South Africa in standard of living as measured by the Human Development Index, which takes education and life expectancy into account, not just GDP. And that is quite significant because uh, it's a truer reflection of how it's going with the people in that country. Because you can have a super rich person moving into a smaller country and then suddenly the GDP per capita pops up. Um, but you will not be living for a thousand years. So life expectancy is probably a more honest way of understanding what's happening to the people and educational uh, level. Uh, yeah, we know Bill Gates was a university dropout, but he became very rich afterwards. So uh, yeah, uh, it's very interesting that uh, education and uh, medical uh, access to medical uh, services. And Botswana has overtaken South Africa because they are actively building schools and clinics. And uh, hopefully the rest of Africa can follow that example and go straight up rather than first going to there, using a lot of energy and then come back. So the trajectory that one would like to follow in all of this is actually to increase the standard of living uh, or the HDI basically then, um, but not increase our footprints in terms of uh, consumed electricity or energy, basically, and the impact to have a smaller circle means less environmental impact and to be higher on the human development index is, is the desirable thing. So you actually want to end up here. America wants to migrate left, Germany is on the way, UK, Denmark, they're all heading for this top left corner um, by reducing what they're using. So for the countries in Africa, it might be very prudent if we can rather try to just go straight up. So that to us implies smaller uh, systems 
that are distributed. For comparative, uh, this is uh, Africa has 58 countries. There's still some discussion about Sudan being two or one or so on. So it's a dynamic situation. Uh, and the EU has 28. So Africa is significantly larger just from the number of countries. And then the one that I like to look at is the scale of the challenge for, for Africa and then for implication South Africa. You can take Africa and you can plonk the USA plus Alaska, China, Germany, France, UK will nicely fit in Madagascar, and you'll have space for many more. It's a really huge continent. It's a landlocked continent, which has uh, limited the ways it could develop in the past. Uh, for interest sake, this is a, the continent is about 10 times the, the land surface area of Europe, but only half the coastal length, because Europe has a tremendously uh, long coastline, with lots of small bays and islands and things. So the European coastline is much larger than the whole circumference of Africa. And that drives how things developed over the ages. Um, brings us to the solar resource. Africa is blessed with its location. It's straddling the equator. So we have a really nice uh, solar resource. And uh, it has become accessible now due to the developments in technology. Uh, solar panels creating electricity directly from sunshine is fairly cheap in my lifetime, and it's the only thing that became cheaper. Uh, anything else got more expensive. And then we look at population, because that, that's also a driver for the solutions, which are feasible and which must uh, be left alone. Average population density for Africa is about 38 people per square kilometer, but that's the average, it's a, it's a calculation. We know that you've got the Sahara Desert and you've got uh, the coastal areas uh, where people live quite close together. And in the Sahara, there's almost nobody. So South Africa also on average sits at 42, which is slightly be higher than the, the African average. Egypt sits at 87, which surprised me, but it has a fairly large population. You then start looking at European countries for comparison. Italy sits at 207, Germany 234. And to my astonishment, China sits at 146, which uh, doesn't fit with the images I see on TV, but they normally make those images in Beijing and Shanghai and places. They seldom go out into the Gobi Desert or up into the mountainous areas. So the average is actually not that high. And Nigeria, which is the most populous country in Africa, sits at 192, which is about there in the ballpark for, for Europe, for, for Italy, etc. Namibia, though, is on the other extreme, and Botswana similar, with two or three people per square kilometer. And most of those live in the cities, and then you've got the huge desert areas where there are very few people. And then, for fun, Mauritius has an average of 653, which is higher than any of these. And that's because it's a tax haven, so they don't produce everything they consume there. They have the money to bring it from elsewhere. And, and to reinforce that concept, Monaco is very small, but it has 15,000 people per square kilometer. Uh, but they have a lot of money because it's a tax haven. So they can bring in anything they want from elsewhere. Uh, they don't need to produce it or mine it right there where they are. And then to just uh, scuttle this whole thing, Deep Slit here, north of Santon, has 26,000 people per square kilometer, and it's not a tax haven. So you can't generalize that tax havens always have these high population densities. Deep Slit is uh, because of the proximity to Johannesburg, where the people work, and they have families and everybody moving in there. Let's, let's pick under the hood. So this is a population distribution uh, draw for Southern Africa, just giving you some, you can clearly see Gauteng, yeah, with its very high density, and then you can see the Karua and the Kalahari areas with very, very low densities, Namibia, Botswana, almost nobody there. 
And then for further reference, I took the Southern African Power Pool grid. Now, this is a two, 2006 uh, data from the ESCOM annual report. It hasn't changed much. Some of the dotted lines have been turned into real lines, and some have not been turned into real lines because those were planned projects at that stage. But if you then take a country the size of France, Germany, and Italy, um, Switzerland, you can plonk them down here, and they won't actually touch the high voltage lines, um, which is something to stop and think about. Uh, in Gauteng, we are used to this very high density of high voltage lines. You can travel 10 minutes in any direction, you will probably cross at least one line, uh, very similar to Europe. But for the rest of Africa, that's not true. It has a very low uh, availability of these uh, services. So people are still mostly uh, relying on themselves. Mozambique, for example, very similar, just reinforcing the point. Huge areas with nothing, and then lines coming from South Africa, running from Kombarabasa to, to, to Pretoria, and so on. 27 million inhabitants in total, only 25% uh, electrified, 37 people per square kilometer. So looking at the opportunities, this is a slightly different map for solar. It takes the weather into account. Uh, we know that on the coast here with Nigeria and uh, these countries, uh, there's a lot of rain. So they often, even though the sun shines a lot there, it doesn't get through to the people on the ground. And now you can start uh, understanding that uh, using solar in Nigeria might not be the best option because they, they're still better than Germany up there, but they uh, are not the best in Africa. So for Nigeria, it might make sense to build solar farms up in the north and build transmission lines to bring it to the coast where more people live. You look at Namibia, though, where people are spread out, three per square kilometer type of thing, and you start seeing that, hey, they've got sunshine everywhere in abundance. South Africa is similar, except they're along the coastal areas. So you must think differently about these things, how and where you can apply your solutions. Um, so other trends are resource depletion, which we are well aware of, uh, from fossil fuels down to uh, other uh, resources like steel, metal, iron ore. Technological developments have changed what we can do. And obviously, <clears throat> we live in a time of huge geopolitical shifts. So we will have to watch and see what, what comes out of all these things with BRICS, et cetera. So here is, is, a, is a graph from, from our statistics essay showing how the iron ore uh, production uh, goes down over time. Similar with coal, the more we mine to, to earn money, the, the, the less there's left in the, in the ground. Uh, which is something to think about, because if we want to build uh, lots and lots of transmission lines, we need, we need metal. This is a moment to pause also, is the um, electricity being sold in South Africa. This is also from Stats SA uh, in 2019, not, not even this year. Uh, I think it's gotten worse. That it has actually peaked in about uh, 2005, it slumped, and then it got another peak. And then we've been on a downward trend forever, um, and probably going faster now. This is part of what Tracy mentioned earlier, that uh, people are now starting to rely on their own solar generation and other forms, or they uh, become more efficient by uh, installing LED lamps and stuff, which uses less. So this all plays uh, a role in the bigger uh, scene. Uh, for South Africa, resource depletion, this is the gold uh, mining activity we're down here at the moment. Uh, uh, we've seen our peak in 1970 when things were booming. Um, that is also uh, something to chew on because that means the, 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 the mining activity is moving elsewhere. So you can't rely on, on just uh, taxing them anymore. They're not here. Uh, let's keep over with those. Um, from all of this stuff, you, you, you come up with two forms of electrification for uh, low uh, 
income areas. There are the people living out in the rural areas who will never really encounter a transmission line because it's just going to be too expensive to build these lines to reach those areas in Africa. Or you get informal electrification, for lack of a better term, uh, around our cities where people come and they squat. Uh, the deep slit example, there's too many people. Uh, they arrive too quickly. Uh, so the formal systems can't keep up with the rate of uh, influx. Uh, this gives a breakdown on the electricity use per province. Uh, Gauteng is champion way up there with all the heavy industry in and around Gauteng. Uh, it goes down very rapidly uh, as you go to the more outlying uh, provinces. Population, again, Gauteng has the most. And from the colleagues in the humanities who study development and, and human activities, they are well aware that cheap energy makes life better for people. So this is a, a aerial picture of the deep slit area. The original formal areas are on the bottom right. And then basically almost clockwise, it just went crazy. So 26,000 people per square kilometer is what you have up here in Ward 95. It's really, uh, from calculations, you can't cover that square kilometer in solar panels, you will not generate enough electricity. Uh, you have to bring it in from elsewhere, like in Monaco or Mauritius. So there's the Ward 95 area with the 47,000 people in two square kilometers. Uh, let me skip past that. So we um, are used to this type of system. And uh, this is the one that we can no longer sustain. We have our large centralized power stations. We've got water supply, road network. We've got the transmission lines. Uh, lots of this doesn't happen in your backyard. Uh, the coal-fired power stations sit up in Kumalanga, where the coal mines are. And the trucks destroying the roads drive up and down those roads there. So it's not yet in Joburg or in Pretoria. Um, we are aware of the changes happening right now. and. Um, then there are these areas with the low population density where it has never been feasible to bring electricity, where people still rely on biomass for, for lighting and heating, because that's available directly in, in their environment on the doorstep. It's very difficult to generate electricity just from a fire unless you have a good furnace and you make steam. And you know, so it's not, and cooling is, is even more, more difficult if you do it with biomass. But it's very easy to get more than five kilowatts uh, going. This is where it's heading for the developed uh, part of the planet in Germany. Gauteng. Uh, we'll see less dependence on uh, centralized power stations, uh, more use of distributed generation uh, embedded in uh, the various areas, like in industrial areas, residential areas. I'm showing wind turbines here as well, but that might not be as effective in South Africa, but um, solar water heaters has already been famous for a while, and now we're adding solar, and some people are actually playing with biogas, which you generate locally uh, and use to supply some of your heating needs. So it takes the pressure off the grid, and the grid starts having a different role. It also shows that you, you will need yeah, there's less reliance on the grid uh, over time. So these all mega trends that are happening as, yeah, we, we're aware of these things. What's happening out in the countryside is solar home systems have been uh, becoming popular. And they replace the lighting, communications, entertainment. They can satisfy those needs. So in the daytime, you use the sun to generate electricity, charge a battery, you can charge your phone, you can have some light, and uh, if your system is big enough, you can actually uh, watch a TV or maybe even run a refrigerator. Cooking, though, is uh, difficult with the solar systems because they are typically only around 200 watts, so you can't really, really cook with that. That is still a, a research area that we are active in. So we call the first one distributed generation. 
core system A, where the renewables gets integrated into the grid. Uh, our REAP uh, program in South Africa, you, know, you, you have large solar farms and wind farms getting integrated into the grid. Uh, there are also grid connected microgrids. There are some uh, companies that have turned the campuses into uh, almost uh, OTOC, autonomous uh, places where they can provide all their needs, but they are still connected to the local uh, council. But there's also a need for standalone systems uh, in area B, system B type of things where they have no grid to, to connect to. There is no legacy grid for them. They, they, they're still waiting for, for decades to, for it to arrive. And there you also have less roads, you have less access to technical support. So you need a lot of resilience in the systems and they need to be scalable so that you can start small and grow. This is uh, reflected in some publications where they start talking about mini grids and micro grids. Um, even Anglo American is going to launch a renewable energy company in South Africa. Uh, so, so people are waking up and starting to get to grips with this. Uh, so the teams that we think are, are developing as we speak are what you would call personal power. If you can power your own uh, communication device and then maybe your computing device and uh, then the lights that you want to use, maybe eventually your home, whole house, eventually maybe the whole neighborhood or the whole village. And out of these uh, crystallized things that we call picogrids and microgrids, uh, according to our definition and our understanding. So in these microgrids we refer to our standalone ones, um, which supply a whole community, a whole farm, a whole uh, mining activity in a remote area. And then the picker grids are the extreme small ones, which will supply a single user or a single household. So we've been working on what we call a picker grid. I think my time is running out. Tracy. Yes, yes, I, it's, it's been so fascinating. I've been loath to stop you, but uh, if you could please <laughs> maybe wrap up in two minutes. Uh, yes, so uh, what we have been doing at this is we've been looking at what we call a pico grid, which is uh, uh, trying to address this issue of scalability and stuff. And uh, I think we can say we're successful right up to the point of cooling. So we can use solar, we can um, even integrate other sources, uh, not just solar, um, we can scale it. Uh, you can have multiple uh, nodes, these green ones. We can even run AC appliances. Uh, and this is, uh, you can start very small and grow it over time. So things don't become redundant, uh, but we're still facing a limit of about 500 watts and not really uh, able to do cooking. Uh, that's a picture in our lab. We are doing the testing since 2014. This is a nicer picture. I'll skip over that. Uh, we are also planning for the future to interconnect a 1248 volt version of these so that you can eventually do the cooking because with 48 volts, that's what most of the systems in uh, residential areas these days, they can run on a 48 volt uh, battery. Um, and then you can start going for five kilowatts, which enables cooking, if you're careful. Uh, Nature-inspired concepts that we've applied to make this a fully scalable system. And uh, we've also been dabbling with microgrids in, in rural areas. Uh, most notably, there was a project uh, from, from Anglo-American in Kronstadt on a standalone one driven with methanol. They did not want to include uh, solar, which was a pity because that would have actually, I think, in my opinion, made the thing work. It's now been uh, dismantled for the last five years already, but uh, we learned a lot from that because we had access to the data and you could learn a lot from analyzing and looking at how people are using electricity just for fun. You can literally see the weekends, these fingers. Uh, you can see that this is early morning, that's in the evening. So people wake up, they maybe take a cup of coffee, go to work, come back in the evening, watch TV and cook dinner. And then yeah, this very dark part here is the winter. People in the free state go to bed very early. It's blisteringly cold and they only rise at the last minute before they go to work. And then you can see these dark lines where 
the system was out of commission and so on. So data analytics, really famous term these days, uh, you can apply to these things to learn more. Okay, business opportunities. You need a low cost of entry for these areas um, because the people there can't, uh, I think you alluded to the fact that they don't have a house and they don't have a bond. And if they have a house, it's not worth so much that the bank will look twice at giving them a uh, loan. Operating cost needs to be low, maintenance needs to be low, and it needs to be very resilient. You take knocks, uh, also preferably self-healing. So if you remove the broken thing, the rest should still work. Uh, so it is fault tolerant and electronic. Those are the features we've been trying to incorporate in the stuff that we've been developing. This is dreaming of bigger, higher capacity uh, grids, more conventional. Uh, and this is the stuff you will see on mines and large agricultural estates, for instance. And I'll stop there, uh, including remarks. There are real challenges. This big continent, as I've tried to show you, centralized solutions doesn't work to get it to everybody. Uh, there are already technologies. I'm excited about the solar photovoltaic, which has really become uh, very mature and, and affordable now. So the trends are in the right direction. However, the, level, the last one is to educate people that there's no one size fits all solution. Uh, uh, you really need to understand what is the solution for each problem. Thanks, Trace. Thank you so much, Willie. Really, really fascinating, uh, and you know, just confirming my long, long-held belief that um, we, we don't need centralized solutions in Africa. So, thank you so much. I wonder if you were, if you wouldn't mind just posting in the chat links to some of your research, so that the people who are on the line can, because you haven't had time to unpack those pico grids and micro grids. If you could just give us um, maybe some links in the chat, Willie, that'll be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, Dan. If you don't waste any time, over to you. Okay, Tristan, uh, can I just check if there will be any time for questions at some stage? It's the end, yes. Hopefully, if we have some time, we will have some time okay, for questions. Okay, then I'm, I'm motivated to try and make a bit of time. Um, let me just find my slides. And please also, uh, participants, if you have questions in the meantime, you can post them in the chat. Just give me one more second. OK, that looks like it's visible, isn't it? Not yet, but I'm sure it's going to come. Yes, we go. There we go. OK, um, so yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm, really gave a gave an excellent um, presentation that allows me to uh, um, uh, to skip a few things. Um, I, when I saw the, um, the list of, of, of people attending this, this seminar, I decided to, to rip up what I wanted to do originally and, and insert um, some more visuals and some more overview and sort of less academic. So um, I just want to take you, I'll give you a quick overview of what's happening in the UK. I, I think there's uh, some similarities with, um, with, with South Africa's situation, of course, many, many differences. Um, so I'll try to keep it brief less than um, 18 minutes given uh, so we have more more, more opportunities for, for questions at, at the end um, so Scotland is well certainly within the UK uh, I, I cannot speak internationally but um, there's, there's a fair bit of uh, community energy projects going on relatively speaking it has a lot to do with the particular political situation in Scotland um, and this is where I think there's some some that might resonate in South Africa there's issues around historic restitution of land rights um, and when communities were given land rights um, the first thing they they were asking themselves is what can we do with this uh, with this land and and one of the easiest ways to generate some some income was through through wind um, so and there's been also been the way the Scottish government was able to tap into into funding for that had a lot to do with the European Union uh, rural development policies 
Um, so quite a specific uh, background in Scotland that was different from the rest of the UK. Scottish Scotland also became, um, you know, gained political, more political autonomy over time. And of course, when Labour government changed into the Conservative government um, around 2010, what happened is basically the Conservatives abandoned uh, a lot of uh, low carbon and renewable energy uh, initiatives, except for offshore wind, uh, whereas there was a continuity of policy in Scotland. Um, so as a result, if you like it at the UK scale, what's happening in Scotland looks looks relatively um, more more progressive. Um, these are the, the numbers and the slides are all from Community Energy Scotland, which is was set up by basically by the Scottish government and sort of as a parastate or if you like, and now they're sort of an independent um, energy advice bureau, but they still get a lot of their, um, uh, if not core support, then at least a lot of project uh, support funding um, through uh, Scottish government. Um, what we've seen is a lot of the uh, community energy projects were um, uh, in off-grid locations, so uh, some of the, the islands or in edge of grid situation where um, you know, back in the old days, um, there was a, a single wire running from, you know, from the central belt or from the more populated parts of, of, of the island to uh, to these remote communities. And now, of course, with w especially wind farms, um, the electricity is sort of sent back uh, to the center and um, and how much wind they can uh, wind energy or wind electricity they can they can sell is often uh, limited by by the thickness of that old wire. So the Isle of Egg is is the most well known example of a community mini grid uh, in a, an island that is off grid. Um, so it has um, uh, wind turbines, it has PV power, and it has a hydro plant, a power plant, um, and and the old diesel generation generator that they once upon a time had is, is obviously still there for for backup. Um, and then Gia is, a, is another island where the first uh, community energy project was set up. Um, they are grid connected, so they were able to sell the electricity and the money went into a community fund and they used it to uh, undertake um, things that the community collectively found important. It's an interesting case study because actually a lot of people in the community were against wind turbines. They thought it would make the island ugly, etc. But they agreed, this is quite interesting, they, the reason, the way in which they came together as a community and agreed that they didn't want to have the wind turbines is because they focused on the what they would use the money for. And they decided that they need, I think they needed a nurse to look after the elderly people so they didn't have to go off to, off to the mainland to live in an old folks home. And I think also they got some additional teaching uh, capacity in the local school, which of course has only a few kids in it because it's a small community. So by agreeing on the social benefits from from the income, they agreed to have wind turbines and they agreed that three was enough. Later on, they, they became a bit more greedy and added a fourth, but they could have added more wind turbines. And they didn't go for sort of maximum electricity. They went for um, a shared community understanding of what, what extra um, money they wanted to support their community. And then I also have uh, ORF there, that's Orkney Energy Forum. And, and uh, on Orkney, they've been very, very entrepreneurial. It's especially a farming community. A lot of these farmers, they own their own land. They're very entrepreneurial oriented. Um, they already had a lot of money coming in from uh, North Sea oil and gas, and they've jumped on the renewables bandwagon. I should also say, um, you saw Willie's maps of, of Africa, um, energy or wind in uh, in places like Orkney is, is hardly intermittent. It's there year round. Um, some of these wind turbines have a, a higher capacity factor than the most nuclear power plants. You know, it's 80, 90 percent of the time it's generating electricity. Uh, OK, so in addition to Scotland, what we have, we've also had the energy cooperative uh, movement. I call it a movement because it is, that's what it is. They, they are organized also across Europe. Um, you know, they share some some core values. The, um, the whole idea is that um, it's sort of some kind of it's a it's democratic system. Uh, you buy shares that buys you also um, uh, voting rights. Um, often they they limited the the size of the shares or made sure that they had some really small shares. So um, you know, a hundred pound could buy you a share. So it was you know to to increase affordability. Um, and you see, so we've had thirty three of these projects in uh, in the UK, of which uh, almost half in Scotland. And it, it cuts across wind, solar, and hydro. And this tree shows you the um, yeah the Sorry. sequence of projects. Sorry, Dan, I just wanted to check on the your slides because it's not moving on my side. I don't know if 
it's been moving for the other uh, participants. So we, we've been on the same slide. Right. OK, I have the energy co-op slide on my Let screen. Ah, there we go. OK, I will, and now can the participants see the energy co-op slide now? Uh oh. This is a concern. Let me see if I can. Technology. I think maybe um, if you share your screen rather than the presentation uh, mode. You can oh, move. Okay, so the, the the participants are able to move through the slides manually. So what I suggest is that you just tell us when you are when you are moving. <laughs> I, I didn't even know there was such an option. So my apologies. This is uh... okay. Uh, I, I, so I think you can see the slides un underneath, can't you? Yes. Yeah, so uh, so I, I can move them. Can you see me move now? Stacey Lynn, can, can you? Yes, 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 we can see them. It's OK, so my apologies. I instead I, I was moving them with my cursor and I should have moved them with. Um, OK, yeah. now we've got a thumbs up. Awesome. OK, so I think, OK, let me quickly. This is the Community Energy uh, Scotland slides. This is the examples of the particular local um, community energy projects in uh, a few of them in, in Scotland. Um, you'll be able to Google them if you if you have an interest, and I can obviously share the, the links with you. Um, and this is the energy uh, co-op movement um, that I was talking about. My apologies for uh, for the mess. Um, and then what we also have in in England is that um, there's there's a membership organisation called Community Energy England. It's quite interesting that they include Wales in their map, um, but not in their title. But there you are. Um, again showing a lot of activities and so the difference between community energy england and community energy scotland and that is quite important so the one was a parastate or with support from the scottish government and the other one is a membership organization basically because the westminster government uh, took very little interest in the concept of community energy um so in a nutshell i would say that it you know on the map it looks like there's a lot of community energy projects in the uk um, they are very diverse, you know, from from solar, wind, and and, and hydro to to all sorts of other sort of hybrids, um, but also f diverse in terms of finances and, and organizational modes. But they still don't add up to a lot uh, if you look at the national elect uh, electricity stats. Um, so, for example, Orkney produces, I think, 150% of its own electricity. So they, uh, as as a, as a micro region, they sell off a lot. Scotland is 100, 105%, I think, at the moment. Um, and I think the UK as a whole is, I forgot what the latest numbers were, I think around 30% of the electricity is now generated through renewables. And it's it's mainly wind. Uh, but we also have a million households who have solar panels. I, I haven't really included them in the talk because that's, that's individual um, uh, home ownership rather than community. But of course, in the future, there are obviously ongoing discussions about but you know the the roof the roof is is collectively owned or or maybe your your roof is not really suited, but your neighbor's uh, garage is suited. Can you rent their roof? So these kind of discussions are also ongoing. Um, it's important to realize, however, that community energy is is almost never just driven by uh, by you know solely by the idea of return on investment or by maximizing uh, electricity output it's always um, wrapped up in 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 a, in a wider um, value proposition a lot of it to do of course with, uh, with with concerns about climate change i think there's a there's a wide acceptance that uh, this country uh, the industrial revolution started here we've put a huge amount of uh, um greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to become so wealthy and you know we do have a, a duty of care a duty to act uh, unlike in the us i think broadly speaking in europe and you know until populists uh, gain, gain power i think there's a wide acceptance that we have a historic um, responsibility in that respect um, 
and but also we um, it, it can be of, of significant value uh, locally um, and, and I talk about socioeconomics because actually have a, we have a very high level of, uh, of energy poverty in the UK. Um, I think now with the war in um, uh, and, and uh, in Ukraine and uh, the the peak energy prices uh, more than 50 percent, I think up to 60 percent of UK household households um, are in uh, energy poverty when you define it as 10 percent of uh, of your of your income. Um, I'm not going to open the discussion about about that. Obviously, that very much depends on the. On, on a number of factors, but uh, but it's a major concern. We have excess winter deaths as a result of people living in very cold conditions. Um, I've been in South Africa during the winter, and I think you have it tougher. Um, so again, I'm not going to uh, answer that, uh, address that, but it's 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 important context. Um, and like South Africa, uh, a lot of the grid is old, a lot of the generating infrastructure is old. So stuff is going to change whether you want it or not. Um, investments are going to have to be made. Um, and we can't, there's no point in just, re, you know, replacing the old wires with new ones in, in the same way. We have distributed generation, we got to make priorities. And of course, in some locations, more renewables can actually save you, um, can, can avoid investment. So if you have a, um, what's important in the UK context is that we need a lot more electricity than we used to generate. And the reason for that is because we're trying to now also decarbonize our heating systems and decarbonize transportation. And in both cases, we need more electricity. Um, and the UK is a, has, has a huge amount of untapped wind power. Um, so there's also a, a resource frontier there and the, to, um, yeah, to, to that the, the, the private sector is quite interested in. And I think last but not least, uh, politics is really important. Um, when we talk about energy um, security in, in the UK context, it's usually at the national level rather than at the local level. Um, and uh, I think it's for the first time with, with the war in, in Ukraine that it's dawned on politicians. And like I said, the Tories are, are not so not, not as green minded as, as maybe the, the opposition. But it's dawned on them that actually, for the first time, that uh, renewables are good for uh, for energy security, um, and also, of course, uh, existing renewables generate electricity at a much lower price than, than currently fossil fuels do. So it can also reduce your your energy bills and, and address energy poverty. So that's uh, briefly what what I wanted to. The, the main take home messages. I think in terms of the energy system, it's really important to uh, distinguish in, with the UK is that we uh, heat is our main form of, of energy use. Um, and and this is also where we have grids, we have the gas grid, the, the term that that's the cheapest form of heating. And we have, of course, the moment you have you start to install district heating, which is what we need in cities because of the, the density of, of heat demand, then that also becomes um, a, a technology in which you can store um, uh, your your um, your surplus um, renewables. So of course, the more uh, um, wind or solar you're going to have on your on your energy system, the more there's a need for storage. We are investing obviously heavily in in, in batteries. There's distributed batteries built, built being built everywhere for uh, for microbalancing the grid, but also for um, you know for trying to bridge the, um, the the peak supply with with moments of peak demand. We try to shift demand. Um, this is sort of the usual engineering story, but I think it's important to, to, to understand that actually some of the part of the, the, the future of the electricity grid will be connected to, um, to the way in which we organize heating. And the UK has the oldest um, uh, housing stock. In, I've seen stats for Europe. I can't think of a country that would have all their houses still. So yeah, they're leaking uh, heat uh, in, a, in a massive way. This is also one of the underlying reasons for uh, for energy, uh, sorry, for um, fuel poverty and, uh, and and excess winter deaths. Um, so the more renewables you have, also the more you're going to waste energy be electricity because you can't use it if you don't have storage. So again, a, a very strong connection there. And ultimately, when the lights go out, nobody. It just this has less of an effect on on our well well on on health than uh, when the heating goes off. Um, so I think that's that's a major concern going forward. I had other slides that were more academic. I don't think I'm going to talk about them, but I I wanted to. Um, but I just want to give you a flavour uh, of of the topics I could have covered. Um, so how do you define community energy projects? Um, how have they evolved to date, and what what were the drivers and and um, barriers for them? Um, so. Uh, I'm just 
yeah, again, if you drop me a line, uh, send me an email if you want to know more. I can also send you other papers that exist on this. Um, I could have talked about governance and, and ownership. Uh, Trace Lynn, I hope you and I will have some time to compare notes on that when, you, when you're visiting. Um, how it's oper operationalized is quite interesting. UK examples I've shown you already, but I think you can, uh, by clicking on the links that I will provide, you can find out more if, you, if you're interested. Um, and this is really where I want to uh, I want to wrap up with. So in rural areas, we have different drivers. We saw the same in South Africa. There's a lot of resource. It's much more expensive to uh, to 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 get the grid running there. But also supply issues in any case are problematic. I've done um, recently a project in the Galapagos, and and I was um, interested by the connection with water. And I'm just wondering in some rural communities in South Africa, it might be the same that, you know, maybe instead of having to, in, you know, in, invest in a, if you have solar power and do you need a big battery to provide electricity in the evening or will you pump up the water from, from the local well and, and use the excess supply of electricity during the day for that purpose. And by doing so, provide water, which is even more important than, than electricity, uh, more vital maybe uh, still, uh, but also um, not have to invest in, a, in an expensive um, uh, uh, big battery. I think uh, I've talked about the enablers in the, in the Scottish context, I'm not going to dwell on that, and, uh, but I think um, the biggest barrier we have is a systemic inaction or failure by, by a national government to show a vision going forward. Uh, but in a minor way, of course, it just, it's also provides a key drive for those people who want to do stuff and, and they're then sort of driven to, to take their own action. I'll stop there if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So I think we're going to have to invite you back for another one so that you can get stuck into those governance arrangements, which for me are very fascinating. But uh, yeah, many, many things to think about, and it's great to have that alternate context you know, just the, the whole idea of community energy and community energy organizations, which I don't think is, is popular here. The other thing that we need to think about is, of course, when you're connected to the grid, then you can also trade that energy. So, you know, it might be great to have a microgrid, but it's always it's good to be able to put put energy back into that pool. So that is an aspect we also need to think about. So thank you very much. Um, and, and seriously, we might actually ask you back to do just the session on the governance, which we are very interested in. OK, so Lauren, and while Lauren is getting ready, are there any questions that we can field uh, for, for Lily and for Dan while she is just getting her slides ready? Could make use of the time. I'm not seeing any hands. There was one question about the legislative, legislative environment, which I think we can answer at the end, Luke. OK, thank you. Well, then if there's no questions, um, I'm going to hand over to Lauren. Thanks, Tracy, and I'll try to be as, as quick as possible. Due to the time. So. Yeah, just in, in terms of, of my kind of work, I obviously focus more with communities and indigenous people. Um, so I first asked my question about, you know, obviously the need for community mini grids and what that is. Uh, right now in Africa, there's obviously 60% of Africans live in rural communities. Only 5% of those communities have access to clean energy. Um, these low electrification rates have obviously been explained in the previous presentations uh, due to the location of being able to connect to the grid, a very uh, obviously separated, low populations and also low socioeconomic activities in those communities. Um, the International Energy Agency has estimated that almost 60% of the additional generation required in Africa would need to come from uh, off-grid solutions to meet access to energy across Africa. Um, obviously, the governments are very focused on central grid expansion, and so their policy speaks to that as well. Um, off-grid entrepreneurs across Africa have looked at sort of two major business models um, to expand mini-grids. 
and that's like a pay as you go service, so an energy as a service, and then obviously leasing to own uh, the renewable energy product. Um, I just gave a, I'm going to go through this briefly, a, a profile of Africa and Southern Africa and just mini grids and, you know, sort of the popularity. Um, across Africa, the Africa Mini Grid Developers Association has, they have 40 members who are for-profit developers across 19 countries in Africa. Um, you know, according to the World Bank, there's 4,000 mini grid facilities that are in the process of, of being um, brought online. And then just for interest sake to put on the point that, yeah, it isn't only solar energy that should be looked at for mini grids. There's many different types of solutions, including, and they've estimated 63% across Africa and Asia were solar mini grids, 21% uh, were hydro mini grids, 11% were diesel or heavy fossil fuel mini grids, and 3% were biomass. Um, in Southern Africa, you find that mini grids are, a lot of them are in their pilot phases. Mostly solar energy is being prioritized. And one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is energy storage due to how expensive batteries are, especially lithium ion batteries, which provide better battery capacity. So I looked at a few case studies across uh, Southern Africa. And just to pull out what we can learn from them, where we can grow with them, what was positive and what was negative. Uh, the first case study was solar water heating program that was launched in South Africa. It, it looked at providing 1 million solar heaters by 2014 and 4 million uh, by 2030 across the country. Um, two com communities were piloted, which was Shoshenguva and Alexander. Um, if it was successful, it would take off 12% of the usage of Madupi power station in terms of energy. Um, it would also reduce the obviously the community's electricity bills by 30 to 50 percent and help uh, lower carbon emissions. The program itself wasn't very successful and that it didn't it didn't actually supply reliable access. Um, this was due to poor quality of the solar panels that were brought in or imported products. There was no localization in terms of the products that were used. Um, most importantly, there wasn't proper feasibility studies done or assessments done. Um, and in light of that, there was incorrect installation. So the solar panels being the incorrect direction for the sun exposure to be at its most. Um, there also wasn't batteries involved or battery capacity. So if it was raining or it was cold or there was cloudy days, there was no high hot water during those days. One of the more successful projects that are found for communities um, is with USAID and Power Africa. They work in nine different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they address the issue of healthcare facilities, not having access to energy, and that they identified over 60% of healthcare facilities did not have access to electricity. Um, their project aims to, looking at the countries on the screen provide products with numbers as high as in Ghana for 91 healthcare facilities to be brought and um, to be brought off grid solutions. Um, more specifically, a case study example was in Lesotho. Um, it was for a clinic, which was predominantly um, for a midwife who would have uh, many women coming there to have delivery of their babies. They did have a diesel generator, which sadly didn't work sometimes and also complained about the air and sound pollution that it created. Um, through this project, they were able to give them a ship containerized solar solution or system um, through a local in installer. And what's important about the local installer is that they understood the terrain of the area, they understood what was needed, they understood what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, and so this project has been highly successful. Um, what really stood out about this project for me was the midwife herself saying, if you don't have if you have power, you could never understand what it's like to not have power. And I mean, in the context of a hospital that requires equipment, uh, that can be very problematic in the middle of the night if there's a problem with the delivery of a baby. Um, also, a secondary issue was communication and that there is no telef telephones out in those areas, in the rural areas of Lesotho in the mountains. And so the cell phones can't be charged. So when the cell phone goes flat, um, there's no way to communicate with anyone. Um, another case study that was looked at was in, in Kailicha. It was called the Umbane Project. 
And this was done for a private solar energy company. The area that they looked at in Kyalicha is on the wetlands, so it's not possible to electrify, even though it is not in a rural areas per se. Um, the project looked at 400 Rand installation fees and then had different degrees for different amounts of power usage, including even daily packages for lights and, and TV. The part of the project that wasn't as successful was with 31 women that signed up for the Mbani project, and they bought solar compatible fridges for 3,500 Rand. And what this was intended for was to start businesses with those fridges. They'll pay a, a fee of 480 Rand a month for the fridges, However, if they use prepaid meters, it would be 80 to 160 Rand per month. So it was already more expensive. Um, and issues were raised that they couldn't afford it after they got the installations done. As they were solar appliances, they could only use solar for the fridges, so they became redundant. Um, and there was misunderstandings between the communities and the solar providers and the actual uh, the initiative that was started. Um, another case study would be Omelo, where we actually do work with the community. Right now, Green Cape is in the process of starting a project there that will electrify 300 homes. Why I found this interesting is obviously Omelo is at the center of the coal economy, where the coal power stations are. Again, this isn't so much a rural area in that it just doesn't have access to energy. Um, Green Cape has done other successful projects, which include lighting in Kyalicha. Um, which was basically putting solar lights across a section of the community. And this involved the municipality, also involved training of local community members to put up the solar lights, but also to maintain the solar lights. And maintenance is a huge issue with these kinds of projects. And even though it's just solar lights, it created many different outcomes that were positive with children being able to play outside, people being able to run business for longer periods of time people being able to use the public facilities like the lavatories later at night and it being safe. And so it, it doesn't need to be big projects that make a difference to communities. It can be small projects such as this Kyalicha lighting project that was started, which also then in the process created jobs. So another Green Cape uh, project was in Kyalicha as well with solar home systems. Uh, again, used the same sort of model, economic model, where community members were hired to install and maintain the solar equipment. And um, there was numerous consultations held with community members and community leaders to ensure buy into the project. And this project worked off for the basis of that after 24 months of paying the fees that you would own the solar equipment, as well as a portion of the money received would go into a community fund for further projects. And so Green Cape's projects are very sustainable in a social economic model, taking into account what kinds of communities that they are working in. So like I said, the themes of you know these projects is that they allow for energy access. There's access given to essential services, which uplifts communities. The energy is environmentally friendly. There's also health benefits for communities who are now not using, let's say, paraffin, gas, um, you know, a diesel generators. Safety and security is brought as well through just lighting of communities and improved socioeconomics uh, through job creation if the projects are done correctly. I think it's pretty evident, but you know, the barriers to these mini grids across Southern Africa, the first predominant one is poor community participation and consultation. It's not just about giving energies to communities. It's about, as the previous speaker mentioned, education of communities and giving them information regarding renewable energy, but also understanding what the needs are of the community and understanding what will allow for them to have enough energy to uplift themselves, to grow bigger systems, to grow bigger energy capacity, but also be able to afford it. So that brings in the question of who owns the mini grid. And this needs to be settled up front, like we saw in Kyle Leach's example. Problems were only raised later once they had already paid for the solar powered fridges. And thus it needs to be very um, clear what the concept is, who owns the project and how it moves forward and what the sustainability of that project is. Um, obviously, other barriers are things like low electricity tariffs, as was mentioned previously in South Africa, especially we've seen very low um, electricity fees. 
And so what that creates is a problem for private companies that come in with solar projects or off-grid projects, as they can't go above those fees in terms you know, of, of how they are going to access these projects. And therefore they have an issue of making it affordable. And that's generally done through grants and through government initiatives. However, the problem is, is when the funding stops, what happens next? And so these models need to support socioeconomic sort of build up or um, productivity with this energy and businesses that then can flourish from this energy to keep supporting the energy supply that is provided. The gaps in enabling from sort of a policy level is that the policy that we see today across Southern Africa predominantly only looks at grid and how grid energy works and how we can promote grid expansion. And this is highly problematic as that's not possible at this point in time. It's also the problem with the policy is that it only sees off-grid solutions as being temporary um, at this point in time. As I mentioned, the, the issues of governments or donors is that the funding runs out, and so you need a system that continues to run itself. Just one idea of policies for mini grids, um, and this this sort of graphic shows it. You'll see that in the mini grid side, only Tanzania has policy, and targets for mini grids across Southern Africa don't exist. And so this is where we see the biggest policy gap uh, in Southern Africa for mini grids. So just very briefly, how to make money grids, uh, you know, enabling. It needs to be affordable and reliable. Uh, we need to see tax reductions, tax-free inputs on the products that are brought in um, to allow for it to be more accessible and cost-effective. There needs to be education and meaningful consultation with communities. Um, as said a few times, there needs to be a productive use of the energy. So that it empowers the communities or consumers to pay for the electricity in the long term and become sustainable. Um, I'm just going to skip to the next one. So there are two really great model examples of law for mini grids. Um, Tanzania in 2009 created a small power producers framework, which looked at mini grids and also standardized specific tariff rates for mini grids and power purchase agreements. The other really important piece of documentation is from a static level. Um, they did a, developed the regional energy access strategy and action plan and included in that is a huge discussion and case study examples from Southern Africa on grid based and off grid approaches that could work and how to formulate those strategies to it, enhance access to modern energy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Again, I, I feel like we, we need to have you for the whole hour. Um, fascinating, all those case studies and really feeding into, I mean, our key concern, what are the policy and regulatory frameworks? What do we need to start putting in place? I mean, I have a sense from the speakers today that we we kind of know that we have to develop these decentralized solutions, but we're a little bit in the wild. There, there are many, each problem might need its own particular solution. Uh, we have some models that we can draw on. Um, and many themes coming out, the role of the role of national government, um, the the link between the, the importance of storage, uh, localization, the talking about solar appliances. I mean, I, I wonder why this isn't also part of a, a industrialization strategy, um, but just lots to think about. Are there any questions from the floor for our three speakers? We do have 10 minutes to to field those questions. So perhaps, oh, there we, we've got a hand. Temba. Temba, I was hoping you would ask a question. Go for it. The floor is yours, um, Hi. Sorry, is my mic on there? We can hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks again for, for a great seminar and thank you for the for the rich presentations. It was it was a great uh, mix of, of different um, contexts and projects that was very exciting. Um, I guess my question 
for this group is about how we understand community. And I guess in South Africa, it often feels like we're talking about poor rural communities. And I, I wonder how we can widen that conversation, especially in the context of these mini grids and, and when it comes to financing, for example, um, it seems that the the ones in the UK examples have a these these um, community groups have a really strong institutional or organizational basis somehow, and and in the SA cases, a lot of the communities are needing to work with with US aid or Green Cape, some of which are great organizations as well. But I think it creates issues for community ownership and maintenance going forward, as as Lauren kind of alludes to. Um, to me, it also relates to this thing of how rich individuals and businesses who in a way might be seen as con uh, communities in South Africa are, are getting their own solar solutions and municipalities have, have less revenue now to, to fund these kind of lower income projects. Um, and I wonder if that just also relates to how we understand and define communities. So. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, that was a bit long winded. Hopefully there's something that can be usefully picked up on. Thank you. Uh, I think that's an excellent question, um, Timber. And certainly, I mean, I'm part of a, a community, a neighborhood where we all know we, we all know which block we're part of because we're block 16 that goes down on the ESCOM app. But we keep on getting shifted. So 16 houses that keep on getting shifted. So we've been saying we want to make our own community grid just to stop being moved around. And how is that possible? But um, who would like to take Timber's question? Go for it, Dan. Yeah, just just very quickly. Um, so I just want to reiterate that that question is 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 equally relevant in the UK, um, where we see um, initiatives being taken forward by a community that's not necessarily scalable. It means there's one or two people there who are very special somehow, and and they manage to make stuff happen. The most vulnerable communities. These are people who don't have the capacities. They don't have the, you know, the the time. Um, the, the, they're not in a position in society to take things forward. They don't have the connections. Um, so yeah, super a super relevant question. And I think what it certainly points out is for the needs some kind of an overarching organisation like Energy for All, for example, in in the UK case for energy cooperatives, an organisation that can help them. So they almost only have to sign up as a community to want to take it forward but then then get the full support um i should also maybe also uh, as an example we in in denmark the um, uh, the district heating is also run as a community but it's not at all bottom up the state has said no we're going to connect you to this and by the way you're going to run it so it's not necessarily the case that the community has to be fully bottom up it has to be enabled by uh, by some kind of an external organization to be to be effective. And I think cross subsidization is super relevant in that context. There's no doubt about it. And we see it in many other countries. I, I came across a, a German case where um, in a block of flats, the person living at the bottom was being cross subsidized by people who were living at the top because he travels up and it would be unfair for the person at the bottom to pay their private meter rates and those at the top to benefit from all the energy leakage. So I think we, we yeah the, we we should make it possible and and and, and feasible and to to yeah to create cross cross subsidization going um, and I actually think that um, from the small bits of research that I've done in this area is that when you talk about solidarity not as a as an abstract concept but as actually something about sharing with your neighbours and understanding that their needs and their capabilities are different from yours um, that's not an abstraction that's that's something that most people are are keen and, and willing to do. But I should also say I've seen I've seen the opposites. I've seen, for example, in the case of, of egg, um, they had massive discussion about what to do when with with when they had too much um, spare electricity and they couldn't agree who was more needy than others and should get it for free or for a lower price. So they end up warming the churches uh, <laughs> that the, electri the electricity went into churches because they were those were community buildings. Um, so, yeah, so a really super important topic. Thank you. Interesting. And was anybody going to church? <laughs> <laughs> of course, everybody knew which denomination people had. So, but it was still taking it away from the person towards the the building that was not privately owned. So, yeah. All right. More questions. 
Timber, do you two have another uh, question? I um I guess I've probably got lots of questions floating around my head, but okay. I'm just sort of trying to digest Dan's um, answer, and it's I think it's lovely to to have people from outside South Africa because we always in SA seem to think it's very unique what's happening, and it it, it so often really isn't the case. So yeah, just sort of trying to digest this this different ways of thinking about cross subsidization and communities is very helpful to chew on. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and I think the discussion also raises questions around energy democracy, solidarity through shared energy systems, which is certainly something, I mean, I've seen in our own residence association that it kind of, through our shared suffering of load shedding, we are trying to find solutions together. Daniel, please ask your question. And thank you for participating today, Daniel. Lovely to see you. Right, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the presentations. Quite. Um, an interesting subject matter. Um, the, the one angle I possibly would have wanted to hear from Lauren, seeing that she is uh, on the uh, just energy transitions, is actually making the connection between microgrids and just energy transitions. But Okay, with that aside, but let me check on to this other question that it is, seems to me like the microgrid approach we are taking in the South African uh, context is still purely being informed by that sense of poverty and trying to do that which possibly public sector should have done long ago, but didn't do. And we are not necessarily seeing the other approach that this is the opportunity for socioeconomic empowerment. This is the opportunity to actually provide energy for entrepreneurial activities and not merely for basic, basic services. Equally, if the resource is so bountiful, if the resource is so much, why then can't we also use it to empower people in terms of them being the generators and selling this energy to whoever else is needing it? Why must we look at it purely on the question of basic needs when we actually now have the resource and the technology to fully go the full hog and empower the people, even possibly use it as a fundamental basis of basic universal basic income for South Africa. Why aren't we daring to kind of look at that scale? I don't know. I cannot imagine any other time when an opportunity like this will come for South Africa the resources were distributed, um, the technology is getting cheaper, and there is opportunity to reverse the perspective and the view we are taking on it. Yeah. Excellent question, a comment, Daniel. And I think what you're describing is moving up that HDI graph that really presented. Um, and then also, you know, we've mentioned the links between energy and story electricity and being able to store water and health, but also education. You know, if you, in, electricity is like such a critical infrastructure. If you have it, you can have online education. So I love your comment. I think let, to close, if you could just have a comment from all of our presenters um, on this, this thought that, that Daniel has, the comment that he's made about really changing our mindset around these microgrids. Vili? Really? Okay, unmuted. Yes, I think um, it is good to hear that even in Scotland, things are very diverse. And, and that's the real challenge. We have to start thinking more open. Uh, each one will be unique. So it's not a cookie cutter type of solution. It's something we have to develop the habit of thinking and, and allowing that space for each community or group to resolve it the way it works for them. 
technology is actually not limiting that anymore. Um, so, so we have that freedom. It is all about how we as humans will organize ourselves to make use of the technology. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what, what to add to it, apart from saying that it was a wonderful, wonderful comment and I strongly agree with that. I mean, you, you, I've been in Zambia, I think last time, eight years ago, when you saw somebody who could afford a panel was already selling, charging services to, 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 to other people. Um, I think it's happening at the informal level to, to an important extent. But it, it, you see like the, the real needs in, in rural areas, especially where I'm a bit more familiar with, for, for example, food storage that, um, and yes, yeah, some simple technologies and that the, surely there must be ways to set it up that, that doesn't depend on people individually inventing the wheel, um, but, but, you know, being able, yeah, to some kind of a collaboration of a centralized support and individual entrepreneurialism and community goodwill to, to set stuff up. And, um, I, I, I so much agree with Daniel that uh, there's a, there's a fantastic need and opportunity here. Mm. A fantastic Thanks. opportunity and a, and, a, and a burning need. Excellent. Thank you. Lauren, last word for you. Yeah, uh, thanks for this really great um, uh, webinar today. I want to say I, I completely agree. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I think it, it's a, definitely a model that's also being suggested of obviously business feeding excess from renewable energy to communities around them and benefiting them uh, through that process. And I think also there is a huge focus on energy access and that's problematic and that's not focusing on what we could do with it productively. And that's why I speak about socioeconomic rights, how we could formulate businesses around this and models that then sustain communities instead of it just being for basic things like charging a phone and keeping the lights on. OK, excellent. We're over time, um, but I really just want to thank all the speakers. I certainly learned a lot today. Um, going forward, I'm really excited about this idea of Community Energy South Africa. So maybe that's where we can have our next discussion and next series of webinars. How do we create this enabling institution that can drive this change? And then also just rethinking, completely rethinking the way we're developing policy and law. I mean, we haven't got, got much into the law, but around microgrids, um, because clearly that is where that is where we're heading. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we will disseminate the presentations and the recording. Uh, so yeah. Enjoy the rest of your t your Tuesday. Thank you.